So um, the first point I wanted to make before diving into um, the actual theme itself is we're, we're creating context all the time. We're creating the worlds in which we live in all the time. They're not just there, we're creating them. through, uh, And we're relating to them all the time through through our mental activity, the world we create uh, the worlds through our mental activity. In particular, we create the worlds or the context in which we live through the six senses, which includes the mind, um, which all, all the six senses all produce data, and and then this data is combined with um, with with all the views and assumptions which we hold, very much of which uh, are often unconscious, and then we create the world from combining. The, uh, the sensory input, as well as our views and, as, and assumptions about the world, and we and we divide the world very strongly into me and not me, self, other, me, mine, in, and in, and this is the world in which we live. We live in a very very uh, discriminated world which we create, and to get essentially what we want, and what we want is happiness and security. But uh, the Buddha, as we'll come on to a little later, argued that we're going about it the wrong way and we'll never ultimately get the security and happiness which we want, quite naturally, by using the strategies which we're employing. So the, the extent to which we interpret the sense data and combine it with um, views and, and, and assumptions, and we filter all that through spiritual ignorance, to that extent we're in collision with reality. And because we're in collision with reality and the extent to which we're in that collision, uh, we suffer. Um, we suffer, particularly psychologically and spiritually. We suffer as a consequence. And much of our interpretation and response to sense input is done in a habitual and reactive manner. I mean, I can certainly say that's been my case over the years. And a brilliant exposition, exposition of this kind of operation of the mind is given by Sanger Akshita in his mind reactive and creative if you haven't read it read it it's fantastic it's really great it really brought me to the Dharma but um, when we do consciously shape uh, our world and our experience in response to sensory input data extraordinary things can happen and we as Buddhists have an incredible array of methods and tools available to us to make extraordinary things happen for example, when we do the mindfulness of breathing, we can create a, a, the context of mindfulness in which extraordinary things do and can happen, but which I think we, we take for granted, actually. Creativity dominates over the reactive and habitual when we're mindful, or potentially. Love can be used to overwhelm the strong impulses which we have towards self, greed, hatred and delusion and so on. So within the context of mindfulness, every time we do the mindfulness of breathing, we have, we can create a context in which extraordinary things can happen. And I'm not joking, you know, I'm not using that word lightly. I work out in the world. I do not work, you know, primarily with Buddhists. And I see what an extraordinary world, uh, world I have access to through, uh, through Buddhist practice, theory and practice, which many other people don't. And I, and I do not take that for granted. So when we practice the Metta Bahavana, again, we, extraordinary things can happen. We can create a context of universal, unconditional love. How extraordinary that is. When most of us, uh, or, or our common sense is saying, it's all about me. I love because I want something. Um, and and Metta Bahavana frees us, frees the mind, or frees me, from the restrictions of habituated conditional love. That is extraordinary. Extraordinary and quite, and quite rare. And I remind, I'm, I'm reminded here of the words in the dedication ceremony, which we do at the beginning of retreats and so on, which always strike me when I hear them. Though in the world outside there is hate, here may there be love. So when we go away on retreat, we try and um, create a context, a world of, of infused with love. And how extraordinary is that? Well, I think it is. And we can also create extraordinary contexts by, make, by participating in what's available to us here at the centre. There's friendship. There's, um, in particular, Kalyanamitra, which is a certain kind of 
committed um, brand, if you like, of friendship. We've got study groups. And I, you know, as somebody who's been involved in study groups over many years, extraordinary things happen in study groups when you get groups of men and women together and we start talking about the Dharma. Um, we've also got retreats and we've got pujas and so on and so forth. There's loads of contexts. Well, we, we plug in and we create a, a, these extraordinary contexts. But um, if you're like me, we forget. I forget the powerful context which I can create um, by, for, for example, uh, well, meditation isn't a problem for me, but, uh, you know, meditation itself can create a wonderful, powerful context in our lives. But uh, do we do it regularly? If not, why not? What's actually, why are we not creating those wonderful contexts for mindfulness and, and metta? Well, we, I know what, it's our habits, it's our karma, it's our samskaras all come flooding back and just over, and so easily overwhelm us with, uh, with our habits. We just go back, back to our habituated self. The power of habits is described in one sutra as like a, a, a really powerful waterfall. Um, and habits are extraordinarily powerful. I mean, I don't know if any of you have smoked, but trying to give up smoking, I mean... I, you know, part of being habituated to something is you're addicted to it. And there are certain pathways set up in the brain to reinforce that addiction. So we return again. The, the, the default is for us to return again and again to the reactive mind based on habit, and unexamined assumptions, views, and prejudices, prejudices. But again and again, I, and, and if we want to be actively practicing Buddhists, must... must must return again and again to the path of the Dharma. Now, what that path is for you, um, you need to, uh, you'll, you know, some of you will be well on the way to sorting that out, but others will have to work that out. You know, we have to work out how we're going to practice the Dharma, given our temperaments. And that is not easy. And that's why friendship is so important. Friends can help us work out what our path is. Because when you read the Pali Canon, it it's all seems so well worked out, linear sometimes. A... B, C, D. Very nice, very well worked out. But actually, uh, most of us are probably A, Z, Y, X, bing, 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 and then we would come back to B. Well, I certainly was. Um, anyway, that's all um, as a matter of prologue, actually. Because <laughs> I wanted to get to the uh, title of the talk. And the title of the talk comes from events in my life which have occurred since 2012 which have included a stroke and an accompanying near-death experience, the death of my mum and a subsequent life-threatening illness of my dad one month later, and the deaths um, of Pramodana, Stan, Arimati and Bodhirakshita. So there's been a lot of, um, a, you know, a lot of powerful material to, well, to, uh, to apply the Dharma to um, over, since 2012. Uh, uh, 12. And these, these events have certainly prompted um, a, a pretty intense and pretty persistent inquiry into how the Buddha's teachings are relevant to both living and dying. Now, I emphasize living and dying because we all live and we will all die. If the Dharma is just applicable to living, it's partial. So it has to be applicable to living and dying and also what happens afterwards, physical, after physical death, I think. And, and the fruits of these inquiries have been extremely illuminating and actually quite life-changing, at least internally. So I've really tried to, I've really made use of the Dharma and put it to the test um, in, in, some, in some quite um, unexpected situations. So prompted by, my, um, by events since 2012, my, my inquiry has led me to a, a much deeper, well I would say a relatively deeper more direct understanding of the Buddha's teachings in theory and in practice. And out of that has come an unshakable conviction that the Buddha's teachings do indeed provide a context for living and dying. Not that I had much doubt before, but I didn't know, you know, I've got some kind of experience now, the fact that Dharma works during a dying as well. Um, and I didn't know that before, you know, the near-death experience. And I believe that the Dharma can... Um, being all, well, certainly for me, an ultimate refuge. You know, when your chips are down, what can you rely on? And I can, I know that I can rely on the Dharma during living and dying. 
because there's nothing else I've found, as I'll come on to a little later, during the near-death experience, I, I started to grasp at things and nothing worked apart from um, my Dharma practice. No person, no people, no career, no material security was at all relevant to uh, the near-death experience, as I'll come on to a little later. But I've had to work on developing Dharma as a context for living and as I found that a context for dying. It's not that it's just fallen on my lap. It's taken years and years of, uh, well, struggle at times to really get to grips with the Dharma because, you know, there's always, there's always a resistance to um, engaging fully with the Dharma. When I was ordained, uh, I said to the person ordained me, I said, do you really want to ordain me? He said, yeah, because 51% of you is behind the Dharma and 49% isn't. And that's... That's enough, as long, you know, there was, there, was, there was enough to tip the balance. Now, of course, we have to be practical and um, aware of where we're at. And, and the more conventional, if you like, refugees of people, relationships, material stuff, etc., can be an important support in our Dharma lives. But ultimately, as I found out, they cannot be taken with us when we die. And that, for me, is the point at death. Uh, I believe that we're, um, we're alone with our minds. We're just, it's just between us and our minds. And we have to go through the processes which follow physical death. It's just our mind. Therefore, it's essential, I think, that we work on our minds. Well, I'm certainly working on my mind uh, a bit more um, consistent than I was. As much as possible, purifying my mind of greed, hatred and delusion for the processes that follow physical death. Uh, death to support the best possible outcomes of the journey which followed. Well, certainly for me, after physical death, because I did die for a little while, uh, biologically, that is. Don't leave it till death itself, please. It's too late. Don't, as, I, as I'll come on to a little later. Don't leave it till death. It's too late. Work on your minds now while you've got your faculties, while you've got so much available here at the centre. Um... And, um, you know, I, I, I've, I've been very fortunate. You know, I've, I've been very fortunate. I mean, the, you know, the, um, I was in the kind of 3% of people who emerged from a, a stroke relatively unscathed, so I can stand up here tonight. And I'm really grateful, actually. I'm really grateful that, you know, this might sound a bit absurd, but I'm really grateful that I had a stroke and uh, that um, I, I'm, I kind of came out at the other side, if you like, because it taught me so much. Um, and of course I'm talking here as though there are processes which follow physical death you may or may not believe that and that's for you, know, that's for you to explore but um, I'm, I'm, uh, for me there, is a, there was a process after physical death and if I had any doubts at all before the stroke I certainly do not have any now that there is a journey that consciousness or better or actually I don't like using the word consciousness awareness uh, takes out physical death and that preparation of the mind now is absolutely crucial to what happens um, during the, uh, the processes after physical death. So I just now want to go on to explore the context for, well, the Dharma as a context for living before I go on to the Dharma as a context for dying. The teachings of the Buddha, of course, as you know, are vast in number, in scope, and content. And I could have chosen any one of many different teachings um, to, to just briefly go through the Dharma as a context for living tonight. But I, I've chosen one, as I'll come on to a letter later. And, but at the heart of all the Buddha's teachings, however, is a concern for us. At the heart of the Buddha's teaching is a concern for the eradication of suffering of all beings. So all teachings eventually lead to that to that and the one I'm going to use tonight is no exception the Buddha said that we suffer because we do not see how things really are the contexts we create are distorted by spiritual ignorance upon which in turn arise views, various views, opinions assumptions, prejudices even that are simply out of harmony with how things really are the world we create internally externally are built, uh, the Buddha would say, upon incorrect assumptions and interpretations of sensory input data. 
For this reason, we never really get what we want. It's a partial satisfaction. We're left frustrated and we suffer. And I've certainly seen that with my dad. It's like all, all, all um, recently, because he's been very ill, and all um, methods of support, all, method, all ways of distracting himself from um, his suffering have been removed and he's just been left frustrated, angry, um, and so on and so forth. And it's, it's really unpleasant to see. It's really unpleasant to see another human being suffering um, like this because the mind is just not prepared for the removal of all these different props. And this deep gnawing of frustration, which in Buddhism you probably know is called dukkha, can lead to all kinds of addiction, smoking, alcohol, and so on and so forth. But it, all, it can also lead to terrible physical violence and even wars. So dukkha is extremely important in human existence. And we have an opportunity to uh, address that, not just for ourselves, but for other people. I was in uh, A&E &E for much of uh, the weekend, because my dad was ill again. And my goodness, uh, there was, there's a lot of dukkha around. Well, I don't need to tell you, tell you that. You know it. So the Buddha sees that as, as, as human beings we are habituated since beginningless time to the illusionary perception that we exist as permanent, solid, discrete entities. And this is really important. In control of events, we think we're in control of events. We are, partially, we can organise our diary. Uh, but that's just partial. The big existential things we, we don't have much control over. When we're going to die, we don't really have much control over. We can eat well, we can do yoga you know, exercise, but we just don't know when, when it's going to happen, really. Um, and, and it's a profound addiction. The Buddha said we are profoundly addicted to this misinterpretation of how things really are. And on the basis of this addiction, we suffer immeasurably. We, we suffer immeasurable torment. We never really get what we want. As, as, as always, well, certainly with me, there's always a lingering frustration. And so do others, because we could, I mean, we, it's very easy to take it out on other people. If we're in a bad mood, somebody might say, good morning, woof. You know, they, they, get, they get our bad mood, essentially. And for this reason, purifying the mind of, del of spiritual ignorance is probably the most important thing we can undertake. Not just for ourselves, but for other people. It's monumentally important to us that we understand how things really are. And I, I, I say that as, a, as, as somebody who's been practicing Buddhism for a while. That's the conclusion I've reached. It's monumentally important. It's not nice to have. It's monumentally important that we, we look into uh, suffering for ourselves and others. Because there's a lot of insight to be had when we do. Um, and so the teaching I've chosen to briefly examine um, the Dharma as a context for living is the five reflections. You've probably, some of you have probably heard them. And I've chosen this teaching because the Buddha makes clear the reflections are applicable to all of us, men, women, children, householder, monk, nun, whatever, whoever, whoever you are, you can use these five reflections at all times under all circumstances. Sometimes, you know, I don't know if you hear this, but I hear people say that the conditions they live in are just not right. They're just not right for me to practice. What I need to do is go and live in a monastery. Or what I need to do is go and live on a mountain. What I need to do is go on a retreat for four months or six months. Well, maybe you, maybe, maybe you do. But I think the, the people I've come across, the majority of people, I think what they need, actually need to do is just um, simply clarify what they're doing and where they're trying to get to. What is the nature of their spiritual life? What, what, what are they trying to do with it? Um, and become more disciplined, more persistent and consistent in their practice, creating a Dharma context for their everyday lives by practicing mindfulness more keenly and reflection in particular. And I think, um, and it's so easy to prioritize, to choose priorities which take us away from the Dharma. 
because we are so we are habituated the path to the path of least resistance. Our habits make us feel so comfortable, don't they? Well, they do with me. You know, so comfortable. You know, the choice between um, sitting on the sofa reading as a, on a winter's night compared to coming to the centre doing an introductory buzzing class. Well, my habits draw me away from coming to the centre. But I make the effort and once I'm here, it's fine. So the teaching of the five reflections is a reminder that we can reflect on the facts of life wherever we are, in the office, at home, on the train. And they are, firstly, I am subject to old age. I am not exempt from old age. Secondly, I am subject to illness. I am not exempt from illness. Thirdly, I am subject to death. I am not exempt from death. Fourthly, I must be parted and separated from everyone and everything dear and agreeable to me. Fifthly, I am the owner of my karma, the hair, the hair of my karma. I have karma as origin, karma as my relative, karma as my resort. I will be the here of whatever karma, good or bad, I do. So those are the five reflections the Buddha advised everybody to reflect upon. And they're extraordinarily sober reflections. Nobody will escape old age unless, unless I get knocked over by a bus tonight. Then I've done it. But I certainly won't, um, I certainly won't escape death. And I will be parted, and I have been parted from people who have been dear and agreeable to me. And I have been, you know, the hero of my karma. I've never escaped um, the consequences of my actions so far. And, but they're not the, they don't end here. The Buddha also recommends that we consider these five topics in relation to everybody else as well as ourselves. So they become all beings, including those that are most dear to us, are subject to old age. They are not exempt from old age. All beings, including those that are most dear to me, are subject to illness. They are not exempt from illness. All beings, including those that are most dear to me, are subject to death. They are not exempt from death. All beings, including those that are most dear to me, are subject to old age. They are not exempt from old age. All beings must be parted and separated from everyone and everything dear and agreeable to them. What are the responses there other than compassion to, those, to that statement alone? All beings are the owner of their karma, the hearer of their karma. All beings will be the hearer of whatever karma, good or bad, they do. In other words, nobody escapes any of those truths. Now, again, you might want to think about those for yourself and think, well, actually, I disagree, but I think they're true. But why, ref why did the Buddha ask us to reflect in this way? What's the point? Well, the Buddha ex goes on to explain in the, in the Sutta where he expands these five reflections that while we're young-ish, we're often in intoxicated with youth to the extent of acting in brash and heedless ways. But reflecting on our old age undoes this, apparently. And, and he goes on, similarly, we're often intoxicated with health and life, taking them for granted, and I certainly did, and consequently acting heedlessly with no thought of the consequences of our actions on ourselves and others for this life or the next. Not aware that any moment health and life can and will disappear. And the, the fact of, of death at any moment has been a constant companion for me since the uh, stroke. And it's been a very welcome companion, actually. It's really, you know, it's really made me look at what's important and what isn't. And that's been a real blessing. It has practical implications. Um, you know, sorting out a will. But it also has um, relationship implications as well. Paying attention to um, any of the, those loose ends which I have in my relationships with people, making sure that they're, they're harmonised or tied up as soon as possible. It's also um, the fact of death at any moment has also made me more vigilant in terms of 
what goes on in my mind. Um, looking at what's skillful and what isn't skillful, and so on and so forth. The, the fourth reflection I find quite interesting, that will be parted from all that is pleasing precious to me, the Buddha explains, goes on to explain, that that's because of desire for those who are precious to us, that we act badly. And this reflection corrects that. And I think that's really interesting. I mean, I've certainly done it in the past. You know, people who, uh, who, I, who, who I'm very attracted to, there, there's sometimes been an ethical... Behavior. This is a long time in the past now. Um, there has been some ethical behaviour. But th- th- those are the, those are the, th- that's the core Dharma teaching which I, which I try and keep in my mind now. Just, it's very simple, very direct, and it has many, many implications. They seem on the surface quite simple and straightforward, but you work out the implications of, of illness and, and death for yourself. You work out the implications for uh, you know, the consequences of an ethical behaviour for yourself. So they're inviting exploration, they're inviting you to think about it yourself. And now I've lost where I am. Um, I think what I'll go on to now, I'll just say these five reflections are not the Buddha being morbid at all. It's interesting, I was having a, a discussion with a colleague at work today and she was, she was, she's not a Buddhist, she was saying that's really morbid. And I, I say, well, how will you feel when you get old, uh, w- w- when you get really ill? She said, I'll feel really bitter. And I said, that's why the Buddha is asking us to reflect upon these, because you will get old and you will die, and it's in your own interest to, uh, to think about it and prepare for it now. Uh, so, um, then, so they're not the Buddha being morbid. He's asking us to reflect upon the facts of existence. Why would we not reflect upon the facts of life? Especially impermanence in, in ethics and the implications of those two. And I, I, it's interesting, I, I've, I've just noticed how glibly we can band around the term impermanence. You know, oh, it does, it's, everything's impermanent. Well, we've got to be careful about that, I think, because we do not want to undermine the profundity of impermanence through uh, overuse and trivialisation of that term. And if we don't reflect upon the five reflections and we're not prepared, then they will break through into our lives with the force of a hurricane. I've seen it with my dad. Um, He's just not prepared for the the truth of these things. And it's also, um, you know, we're just uncovering unethical uh, breaches as well, (laughs) ethical breaches of his life, which we're going to have to sort out, me and brothers and my sister. So make sure, you know, for me, my pro- one of my pro- priorities is to l- not leave a trail of consequences behind me when I die for people to have to sort out when I go. It's really important that I don't do that. So that's why I reflect upon the five uh, reflections, making sure I'm as clean as possible when I die for myself and for the sake of others in particular. And, I, you know, I would say we're not prepared for the full force of the implications of the five reflections, because we can live lives that are orientated and distracted away from the facts of life. How often do we sit down and think, when we wake up in the morning, I could die today. And again, I'm not being morbid, it's a fact. How often do we sit down and say, I could get really ill. What? And I could lose my faculties today, right now. What? Am I prepared for that? And I, and I would say, you know, before the stroke, quite a, you know, there was a substantial part of my life which kept me separate, separated from the ex- existential truths. Yes, I knew about old age, and yes, I knew about sickness, and yes, I knew you about death, but only relatively superficially. Advertising, you know, the, the you know, I'm <laughs> there's advertising boards which show uh, people in their sixties and seventies, the happy couple smiling with white teeth and. Well, actually, if you look at the stats, it, it's close to 60% of people will be single if they've been married by the time they're 65. So, but yet the advertising is saying something very, very different. So 
if you, if you want to have a good counter to advertising, go on the internet and look at the stats. Is this picture, which is being presented by um, Healthspan or whoever for cod liver oil, is it really true? No, for most people. Um, careers uh, can really distract us as well. And remember that busy lives are often spiritually lazy lives. Just because we're busy doesn't mean to say that we're spiritually uh, productive at all. Busy life can be a spiritually lazy life. And I'm speaking, I was lazy, spiritually lazy. So just be prepared and reflect upon the Dharma now to prepare you for the moments when the facts of life will break through. And I'm saying that, as I'll come on to now, from somebody who went through, who, who almost lost his life. And, um, well, I was luckily... Things did emerge and I was kind of prepared, but there was a lot of stuff which I came back for to sort out. If I, and I was luckily in that position, you know, I made a choice to come back, but I, I'll come to that in a little later. So let me just give you a bit of context. I'm now moving on to the Dharma as a context of dying. And for this, I just want to refer to, um, to what happened on the day when I had this stroke and, and, I, and I experienced a near death. Thing and I biologically died for I don't know how long, but all the monitors went flatlined apparently. Um, the, the day began as usual, right? I got up and I was living with Celia Bodhi and Rachel at the time. I got up as usual and we meditated together as usual. No thought of that I was going to that I was going to be seriously ill that day. No thought or very little thinking that I could die that very day. So I got up meditated, had some breakfast, cycled into work. Everything as usual. No thought again of illness, sickness or death. And I started talking to a colleague and then suddenly this overwhelming dizziness hit me and I, was, I collapsed. And I'd known nothing about that, what happened late, uh, until I, I, I was in hospital and in the bed. So, and, uh, and then... Um, you just have to uh, bear, with me, bear with me on this one because I don't know, as I say, I was out of it, right? I was unconscious. But um, at some point I had a sense of leaving the body and I had a, sen a very definite sense of leaving the body and that I had a sense of something big was really happening which I had no control over and I experienced terror, fear and panic which I'd never experienced before. I was terrified. I was really terrified. And I called forth all the teachings of the Buddha which I knew, all the conceptual teachings which I knew. I just wanted some help. I just wanted something to grasp onto. So the wheel of life, the Nidana chain, the four noble truths, you know, I kept grasping at the conceptual teachings and nothing worked. Nothing worked. And... Um, and I realised that I had to change tack, if you like. And I just needed to surrender what was going on. Whatever was happening, I had no control over. So I had to surrender. And I called forth the, um, the Buddha, who I visualised. Who I, That was the visualisation practice given to me upon my ordination. And who I have, I, I've developed quite a strong relationship over the years. And I just said, OK... Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. And that's fine. And I just surrendered. And um, I, just, I just remember this overwhelming sense of faith and confidence, of shraddha, we call it in Buddhism, faith and confidence, which are built up over the years of practice. And I didn't know it was there until it was required. That it was okay, I could just let go. It was all right. I had faith and confidence ultimately in Pratijit Samapada, which is the core teaching the Buddha. I, I, this was conditioned co-production in, you know, par excellence. Just let go into it. And what happened was, once I let go, everything was fine. Just fine. And I had an incredible experience of peace and bliss, which I'd never experienced before. It was just so deep and, oh, it was beautiful. And I felt so light. There was no physical physical form, it was just there, and I entered a world, a very different world, it was just of light and energy with no form, no bounds, it, it was just pure awareness. But what happened next 
my ethical life was held before me. It was like a mirror. Of all the deeds I'd, I'd well, particularly, no, no, there were, there were all, it was a long list, but at the top was unethical, my, my unskillful deeds, right, at the top. And in particular, they were, the, they were the ones which I could do something about. You know, like the uh, relationships uh, with family, for example, they needed to be repaired. That was number two, I think it was. Um, but anyway, there was this mirror in front of me, and it was reflecting back my ethical breaches in particular. And I knew that if I went any further, that was it. There was no coming back. That was it. I was kaput. You know, well, you know, I was in, my body would be in the grave, kind of thing. And then I thought, and I didn't want to come back at all. I just wanted to carry on with what was going on. But um, I wanted to come back to say sorry to people in particular. Say sorry and repair relationships which I'd left a bit, un, you know, a bit frazzled at the edges. And I also wanted to come back and have a, another go at trying to be ethical, you know, a bit more ethical than what I had been. I knew that, you know, uh, if my mind was, was purer ethically, then that would be a very good thing. So I decided to come back. And, um, and the experience of the uh, stroke, uh, you know, that experience has changed my life. In particular, my Dharma life, my understanding of the Buddha's teachings has gone, you know, so much deeper. Um, and, and, and my practice in meditation now, or my practice in life a lot, is just to surrender. It's so easy for us to take things personally, isn't it? You know, I'm offended by this, I'm offended by that. Uh, oh, my body's falling apart and so on and so forth. And it's all about me and me and my, my this and that. But now it's like, it's not me, it's not mine. It's not that I'm a doormat, it's just that you know, my relationship to life is very different. So whenever I uh, would like, when I'm, I'm doing you know, like a mindfulness of breathing, it's like, if I feel myself collapsing around the you know, self-interest, or, you know, oh, um, this meditation isn't working for, or for example, whatever, just surrender. Just go back and surrender, let go of that me and the self-reference and surrender to the meditation. So what lessons have I learned before I close? Well, the key event during the stroke and the accompanying near-death experience, as I say, was that of giving up and surrendering to something which I had no control over and I had no idea where it was going. And giving up and relying more upon faith and confidence and in the Buddha's teachings, it's, it's okay. It's okay just to let go and go with the flow. Um, and as I say, my practice is now much more about just letting go, surrendering. <coughs> Every time I kind of coalesce around me, mine, and so on. And, and, and in my experience, there's so much beauty when I give up self-clinging. It's thrilling. It's blissful. And dhyana, med or absorbed meditation, is a good place to start learning how to give up and surrendering. It's surrendering. If you're obsessive and self-centered in your thinking in particular, absorbed meditation can't happen because we're, we're being kept apart from absorption by thinking about me, mine, oh, I'm upset, whatever, this, that. So part of absor getting into a, a, experience absorbed meditation in dhyanas is just letting go of all of that. Um, I remember my first experience of absorbed meditation while on a retreat at Vajraloka. And I felt the, um, the sense that something was happening, that a new kind of mode of consciousness was, was beginning to emerge. And I was, again, I was really frightened. It's like the, the, the mind was resisting going into a new kind of consciousness. Because I, want, I, cling, I was clinging on to the familiar. But again, when I did let go, it was great. So you know, I just you think there's, there's a lot to be said for just letting go, surrendering. And I think the, na the, 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 um, the nature of consciousness is to be expan ex expansive. And, and that's where the beauty is. Um, but we limit it and we imprison it so quickly. 
um, with self-clinging and all that comes from that. I remember sitting by my dad's bed after he had total organ failure recently, not knowing if his last, what breath would be his last breath. Because the doctor would come in and said, we've done all we can, he's probably not going to live and survive the night. So I just became really acutely aware of the out-breath, I remember. And I didn't know whether there was going to be another breath which followed the out-breath. Would a new breath take place? I didn't know. Again, I just had to surrender. There was nothing I could do here. Just let go, surrender, and just be there for my dad. Hold his hand, you know, keep talking to because in my experience, the last thing which went was the, was the audible sense. So I was just, you know, saying, it's all right, Dad, you know, go if you want to go. Everything's all right. We'll, we'll, we'll be all right. We'll be fine. So I kept talking. And that was my focus. And, and it was beautiful, you know, being there with, with my dad, who I didn't know who was going to live or die, and just having some very pure communication with him, communication which I think really matters. Um, but then um, when I did let go, there's a, there's a kind of thrill of exhilaration as well. Because um, I saw this is how things are. That how things really are is that we're not in control. And this is a real extreme example of that. And I let go and I felt deeply and intimately in touch with something I knew to be real. In other words, I'm not in control. And it was beautiful. Because it, and it was truth as well. It felt really true. And truth is beauty. Every time I feel connected with truth, there's... It feels really beautiful, beyond anything, um, any kind of normal beauty which I can experience. Being in touch with truth is, is really, really beautiful. You know it in your bones that it's true. And incidentally, the, this, this experience from Dan has brought r real poignancy to uh, my mindfulness of breathing. It's like the out-breath. In a way, you're gone. You know, that, that's gone. So there's a, there's a gap, isn't there, between the out-breath and the start of the new breath. And the new breath is new life and new opportunity. And I feel that really clearly now when I'm doing the mindfulness breathing, having sat there with my dad, not knowing whether the, the last out-breath was going to be his last. It's really interesting. And I don't take it for granted. You know, I don't take my breathing for granted. It's, it's great. Okay. Um, okay, just, just, just something, uh, when I surrender and let go, you know, like with my dad or with myself, fear, you know, I, again, it's realising just how much fear there is in myself or has been in myself and other people. Fear of X, Y, Z, fear of letting people down, fear of being late, fear of X, blah, blah, blah. And again, letting go of that has been really interesting. I've entered uncharted territory. And it, and, and it can be deeply disturbing when you kind of go into new territories, new kind of fundamental, diff fundamentally different experiences of yourself. But I've taken confidence that hundreds of others have been through this themselves. You know, the Buddha, um, Sangrakshita, all the figures on the refuge tree, you know, all these people have been through fundamental changes in how they experience the world. And they lived. And they, they lived to tell some really fascinating tales. So it's all right, you know, just to let go and go into a, a, a very different experience of yourself. So secondly, um, conceptual dharma is not enough. You know, you might know loads and loads of dharma. You might be able to tell me what is on page 76 of a particular version of the Pali Canon. That's great, but it re do you really know it? Do you really understand what those words are trying to communicate? Conceptual dharma is not enough. It needs to have penetrated our being, transformed our being, be in our bones, so to speak. We must know, I must know, what impermanence really means um, in terms of experience of life and so on. And the question of how we convert an intellectual understanding of the dharma into a transformation knowing is a crucial one. But it's, it's very difficult. I think it's really difficult to do. But it's, it's something we've got to just, just keep trying to do. And I think 
in my experience, you know, outside of having a stroke, um, uh, persistence. You know, just keep going with your practice. It doesn't matter whether you think it's working or not. By the, by the law of practice at Samapada, something will happen. Just keep practicing. Things will happen. It's guaranteed by the law of practice at Samapada. Secondly, um, conditions. Keep putting yourself in, in good conditions. Study groups and retreats. Kalyanamit friendship in particular. And again, just the law of practice at Samapada, something will arise, something will happen. And engage the imagination. When, when you read some of the Buddha's teachings, engage your imagination. When the Buddha says, um, you know, some of the five reflections, engage your imagination. What would it be like to live with awareness that you could die any minute? What would it be like to live with awareness, you know, in your imagination, of your, the, the last, the, your out breath now, if you're aware that that could be your last. How would that change your life? The, thirdly, what, the, the other lesson I learned is the importance of karma. It was quite clear to me that the, in the near-death experience that karma, more or my ethical life, played a fundamental role in what happened. It brought me back for a start. And, and, and uh, you know, that's, again, that's given me a really, really important insight into the importance of ethics in, in, the, in Buddhist practice. Purifying our minds through ethics. I mean, it's so easy to think, it doesn't matter if I take that one biscuit. It's not mine, but it doesn't matter. No, do no. But your mind does. Reality knows you. You can't escape, uh, well, I can't escape from uh, what my, the, the consequences of my actions. So the importance of my ethical life has, has certainly become more, more important. You know, I was lucky. I, I, I was in a situation where I, I could turn back, but I can imagine a situa situations where that won't be possible. You know, if my body, if I'm cycling along and my body gets really mangled and death is instant, then I, I don't think I'd, I wouldn't be able to come back into the body because it'd be too badly damaged, for example. So my advice to myself and to you is to make sure that your ethical life is as active as possible for, your, for the sake of yourself and for the sake of other people. Indeed, a friend of mine, this was years ago, advised me that if I was feeling a bit low, look at my ethical life. Was there any ethical um, breach which could be related to this? And more often than not, he was right. But of course, I mean, it doesn't apply to, you know, clinic, for example, clinical depression. That's a different um, kettle of fish. But um, very often I can trace disease, if you like, in my mind to ethical breaches. So my advice, as I say to you and to myself, is just keep on top of your ethical life. It's vital, vital that you do so. And ask yourself, what legacy will I... Will, will I leave behind me? Are there any unresolved relationships or issues or family issues that need your, my, your immediate attention? Because we just don't know where we're going to go. Fourthly, um, and not long now, our current culture, I think, is obsessed with attainment and achievement. Certainly the University of Manchester is. It's become more and more so. Um, it's rampant in the workplace. And, and, I, and I see myself being affected by it, but I certainly see uh, people being heavily conditioned by this culture of attainment and achievement. And in it, it's so easy to feel worthless if we don't achieve. But we're measuring ourselves against societal norms. Is that really how we want to lead our Dharma life? No, because the, we've got other norms, if you like, which we're trying to measure ourselves against, including our ethical behaviour. Um, so just be, you know, it's, it, I have to be really vigilant about this. What am I actually buying into when I'm in the workplace? Am I buying into uh, the, the norm of achievement or am I buying into the norm, or the norm of mindfulness and metta? Finally, I just wanted to say that the other thing I learned is that 
at the end of the day, when the chips are down, what's really important is love and relationship. No money, no status, no amount of anything can, when your chips are down, what you need is other people. You need love and other people to come and help you. And uh, career success and so forth is, is, was, in my experience, completely irrelevant to that. And one of the outcomes of the stroke has been you know, building relationships with people. I am dependent upon other people. Much as I'd like to think that I'm not, I am. You know, the food on the table, where's that come from? Well, it's come from farmers and so on and so forth. And because it's, again, I think it's very easy to get caught up in our own little worlds and think, me, 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 me. Independent self. And after enlightenment, I would place love as the second greatest achievement possible to mankind. I mean, love, unconditional love. A love which responds. David Orr writes in his book, Ecological Literacy, Educating Our Children for a Sustainable World. He says the following, The plain fact is that the planet does not need more successful people. How true. But it does desperately need more peacemakers, healers, restorers, storytellers and lovers of every kind. It needs people who live well in their places. It needs people of moral courage willing to fight, to join the fight to make the world habitable and humane. And these qualities have little to do with success as we have defined it. I think that's a really uh, interesting um, quote. So I'm, I'm just going to wrap up now with, with saying, just saying a few words about Sangha. Because Dharma life is not just about us and our mental states and experiences. It's about creating community together creating Sangha for the benefit of the world. And if we form Sangha based upon these five reflections, which I've talked about earlier, I don't think we're going to go far wrong. Because one of the dangers of Sangha, of course, is it becomes merely a positive group. And introducing the five reflections into creation of Sangha really helps that it, doesn't, it, it develops into something, something else. So if we're aware of the five uh, reflections, we're aware that this... We, we might never speak to this person ever again. They might die tomorrow. So look at them. Take them in. Um, they might get really ill tomorrow. We don't know. And so the creation of Sangha on the basis of the five reflections is we're aware of the facts of existence. So what I've... What I've um, that's it. What I've hoped to do is to give you some idea of... Uh, how I've been thinking about the Dharma as a context for living and for dying. And just to, um, yeah, I've learned a, a lot through uh, what's happened. And uh, I've just wanted to say something about what I've learned. Um, and hopefully it would be useful to you as well. But yeah, the Dharma life, you know, if nothing else, the Dharma life for me has, has, has really come at trumps. You know, meditation, friendship, puja. The whole lot has really come up trumps, you know, following what happened. And it's certainly um, been a great support in helping me, you know, I'd nurse mum through cancer, she died. And then, you know, helping nurse my dad as well. It's like, it's really helped me just be a basic, if nothing else, just a basic human being who, who can respond when necessary with love and patience and so on. So, yeah, I just encourage you to carry on practicing and um, creating contexts of mindfulness and metta for yourselves and for the world. Thank you. <laughs>